Okay, we only have 15 minutes, so let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Kate Stanley and today I'm going to be introducing Apache Kafka. Um, I love Kafka, as you might be able to tell by my t-shirt. Um, it has a really great community around it with more and more people picking it up every year. So I've been to all of the Kafka summits this year, there were three. San Francisco was the most recent one, which is where I got the t-shirts. And the thing I find is that the Kafka community is growing literally day by day, and there are more and more people building tools around Kafka as well. But I'm going to try and give an introduction in 15 minutes. So Apache Kafka is an open source distributed streaming platform. Who here hasn't heard of Ka Kafka ever before? OK. Uh, and who here has sort of tried it a little bit? Not many. OK just to get an idea of who I've got in the room. So Kafka allows you to publish and subscribe to a stream of events. You can store events in a durable way, and then you can process that stream of events as they occur. Who here was in my, there's lots of hand raising, who here was in my talk that I gave yesterday on event driven? Okay, quite a few. So for those of you, the next two slides will be a repeat, but I will repeat it because there are enough people who haven't seen them. So Kafka is an event streaming technology, and it is different from message queuing. So coming from IBM, I got a lot of people asking me what's the difference between MQ and Kafka. Well, this is the difference. So a message queuing system has a transient data persistence. So when you send a message to a queue, it goes on the queue, and when it's read off the queue, it's not there anymore. Okay, So it's transient. It's generally used for more targeted, reliable delivery. There's a lot of stuff built into technologies like MQ around making sure you get that message and you send it to exactly who you meant to. And it's generally, because of that, more request reply, asking someone to do a specific thing via messaging. Event streaming is around passing events through your system, so an event is a statement of something that happened. Kafka and other event streaming technologies provide stream history. So that's an important difference. Once the event goes on to, in this case it's called a topic, it stays there and many different people can view that event and react to it. So it provides scalable consumption. Once the events are on the topic, they're immutable. So whereas a message might change as it gets passed from queue to queue, an application might read the message, edit it a bit, put it somewhere else, an event is something that has happened and it shouldn't change, it's immutable. This can be seen even more clearly if you look at how messages versus events are being handled under the covers. And this is the comparison between point to point and publish subscribe. So Kafka is the publish subscribe system. So in systems like IBM MQ, which is message queuing, you have your queue, everyone appends to the end. But the key thing is, if I connect multiple consumers, between them, they will see every message, but you can't have one consumer that can read the whole queue without getting in the way of the other ones. If you want all of them to see everything, you have to create multiple queues and they all get their own copy of that queue. For a published subscribe system, you have this idea of the subscription. So the subscription has access to every single event on the topic, and then you can attach different consumers. So in the left-hand side here, we've got two consumers reading from the same subscription. So between them, they would see all of the events. But for this one, this consumer sees everything. So that's the key difference here. So some of the properties you get with Apache Kafka, stream history, scalable consumption, immutable data. It's also scalable within itself. It's built to be scalable, and it's also built to be highly available. This is the picture that I normally use when describing what's in Kafka. Because we only have 15 minutes, I'm not going to talk too deeply about the pieces on the other side. I'm going to focus about core, how you produce the Kafka, how you consume, and then a little bit about how the cluster itself works. So we're going to start with producers. So when you want to get started with Kafka, the first place I would always send people is to the quick start guide. So this is on the Kafka website. You go to kafka.apache.org slash quick start, and it's just a step-by-step -step how to get started. So the really nice thing with Kafka is when you download Kafka, you get some shell scripts built in to help you get started. So you start up Kafka and Zookeeper in the background. 
Kafka uses ZooKeeper for storing things, but you don't need to worry too much, you just need to stand one up. And then you can start producing. Now, Kafka comes with a Java client, so a Kafka consumer and a Kafka producer that you can start using in your Java apps. There are equivalents in many different languages. Java is the only one that's actually included in Kafka itself, but there are many others in other languages like Node and Go and things that are really great. For this, I'm going to focus on what you would do in the quick start, which is running a shell script. So before you start to run your shell script and produce an event, you have to know what an event is. So an event in Kafka is a key value pair where the key is optional. And we'll see a little bit of why the key is important later. But the main bulk of your event goes in the value, and the key is used for some kind of routing by Kafka, which I'll talk about. So then you can send your event once you've worked out what's going to be in it. And this is the shell script you can use. You can pr provide a broker list. So the broker list here is basically saying, where is Kafka? And if you start Kafka in the normal way, using the shell scripts locally, it will be at localhost 9090. You then have to provide a topic. So we already sort of mentioned topics, but topic is a way to group the different kinds of events. And you have to decide up front which topic you're going to send that event to. So that's the first thing you have to do. Choose a topic. The second thing you have to do is decide whether to use a key. Now. Within Kafka, um, if you provide a key, it will route your event and store it in Kafka in a predictable way. And it helps you with ordering later. I'm going to leave it there until I talk about the cluster later. But you do need to choose. But initially, when you're trying things out for the first time, don't put a key. You don't need it initially. Once you've then worked out your use cases and you understand a bit more about Kafka, then you can make a more informed decision of what you're going to set the key to. But a lot of systems don't use keys because they don't need the ordering, and then that's fine. You then have to choose your acknowledgement level. So when you're producing, this is a configuration option that you set. You can choose zero, which is just fire and forget. I'm going to send the event, and I'm not going to worry too much how well it's been persisted in Kafka. One means I'm going to wait for Kafka to say, yep, I've got the message, got the event, and unless something goes wrong, then we're good. The bottom one is all. So that basically makes sure that you send the event and you want Kafka to tell you at what point it's happy that that event is secure within your Kafka cluster, and it, even if something happens and something goes down, it's still going to be there. So the top one is the quickest, because you just can keep sending the events, you don't worry about it, but you're risking that some of the events might not get there. So if it's events like the temperature, and you're going to get another one in two seconds, maybe that's fine. But if you need more guarantee, you can choose all, but that will slow you down. And the final thing is choosing whether to retry. So obviously, if you don't retry, if there's an error, then your event isn't there. If you do retry, then hopefully it will be there. But if you do have retries, then it means you're risking duplicates. And in Kafka, as it was first created, generally, this was your choice. You either lose messages or you get duplicates. There are things coming in now that change that a little bit. But when you're just first starting, this is a good choice to make. And then later, you can start looking at idempotent producers and how you can get exactly once in Kafka. So these are the four basic choices to start producing events into Kafka. Let's look at consuming. So to receive an event, again, we have this shell script. The bootstrap server is the location of Kafka. You provide a topic. And we've got this from beginning here. So first, we choose a topic. Then we decide where to start. So this is the from beginning. When you first start consuming from Kafka, you can start at the beginning, or you can start at the most recent event. It's up to you. You then have to choose how to manage your offsets. So my little pointer here that says where the consumer A is at number four, that's called offset four. So every event in Kafka has an offset. And as the consumer, basically, as you're reading through the events, you want to keep track of where you've got to. Because if your consumer goes down and then comes back up again, you want to carry on where you left off and not go back to the beginning. 
So you do that using offsets, and you basically store your offsets in Kafka. There's APIs to do that. If you choose automatic, then the Java client or whatever client you're using will basically just handle it for you, and you don't have to worry about it. But of course, that comes with risk. If you haven't finished processing an event, and then you go down and come back up again, you might get in a situation where you miss events or you read them more than once. So if you need more control, then you have options. You can do manual asynchronous committing or manual synchronous. And there's advantages and disadvantages to different ones. It depends on your setup. When you start off, you can just pick automatic. And then again, once you've learned a bit more, you can then make a more informed choice. The final thing is to pick a consumer group. So consumers in Kafka, you can have multiple on one subscription. And the idea here is if you want to scale out and have lots of consumers all working together, so maybe you've got multiple instances of your app, you don't want all of them to read the same events. You want it spread across all of those apps. So that's how you do it with consumer groups. So when you connect your consumer, you provide a group ID to basically say, this is the group that I belong to, and this is who I'm working with. And then what Kafka will do is it will make sure to route you um, separate events to the other people in your group. So between you, you get all of the events. And this is where the key piece comes in a little bit, because when you set a key on your producer, they go into a specific location. If you connect enough consumers, you'll only end up with one consumer getting all the events with that specific key. I know that's a bit vague, but hopefully it'll become a little bit clearer in a minute. So that's how you produce and consume. So let's talk about Kafka cluster itself. It's a distributed system, so you can have three or more even brokers. So these are all Kafka servers. And this is where you store your topics. So we've got topic A, and a topic in Kafka is split up into partitions. You decide how many partitions you want, and they will get distributed across the different brokers. So this is where the key comes in. If I set a key in my producer, every event with the same key will go to one partition. And then when I connect my consumers in a group, they'll get one partition each. And ordering in Kafka is guaranteed within a partition. So if you want ordering in all of your events, you choose one partition, but you don't get the scale. So we have these topics, and they're split into partitions. And we can scale out because we can have multiple partitions, and they get spread out. But Kafka also provides availability. And it does that using replication. So for a particular topic and a particular partition, under the covers, Kafka will be copying it across all of the brokers, or as many brokers as you ask for. You have to choose. But say you've chosen three. So for that topic and that partition, Kafka will select a leader. And all of your producers and all of your consumers only talk to the leader. But under the covers, this copying is happening. So this means that basically, when something goes wrong and one of your brokers goes down, maybe the node underneath or the machine it's running on has broken, when that goes down, you aren't broken as an application developer, because Kafka will do a leader election automatically, assign a new leader, and then everyone just starts talking to that one. And Kafka will tell the producers and consumers where to start connecting, and they will just swap over. So when I talked earlier about the producers and the acts, acts one means you're waiting for the leader. Acts all means you're waiting for all of the replication to happen, and everyone's got it. So acts one means if the leader goes down, you're in trouble. But any of the other brokers going down, you're fine. So it's kind of weighing the risks. So that is a very quick tour of Kafka. One of the things you'll notice is there's a lot of new terms. There's a lot of different things to learn. But in my opinion, having a go with that quick start is the best way to see it in action. Because it's really straightforward. You literally just run the shell scripts in order. But from there, you can start playing around with different settings. And Kafka even provides configuration files like their ready for you default settings that you can then try tweaking and seeing what happens with the different options. The two I haven't mentioned 
is Kafka Connect on the far side. That's me stopping. Kafka Connect on the far side and Kafka Streams. Kafka Connect is to connect to external systems. There's so many people building stuff into this ecosystem, including us at IBM, and then you can do stream processing with Kafka Streams. I've put a bunch of links. So there's the link to the quick start. If you want to know more about Connect, there's a link here, Streams there. Um, if you want to know what connectors are available, so what systems you can connect to, we've listed a bunch of them in our um, GitHub documentation there. Um, the last thing I want to say is, so my product we work on is called Event Streams, and it provides Apache Kafka. But if you're interested, there are more information about how Kafka works and that kind of thing in our docs. And I have some cards at the front and some cool Streamsy stickers if you want to run Kafka on Kubernetes. Thank you very much.